Hey everyone, welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the social impact fashion brand, Noon Day Collection. Are you ready for honest and vulnerable conversations that will inspire you towards action? Join me here every week for conversations on living lives of purpose by leaving comfort and going scared. Today is such a treat. Kim Lewis. Kim Lewis. Ah, she is, gosh, there are not many people in the world like Kim Lewis. She is a little lady with big ideas. She's five, four, four feet, 11, maybe. She's best known for her work as the lead designer behind ABC's Extreme Makeover Home Edition. She's also founder of Kim Lewis Designs. Her work has been featured on ABC, HGTV, TLC, National Geographic. But most recently, she designs restaurants. Torn cheese tacos, anybody? Boutiques and hotels around the world. She also has a passion for building therapeutic art centers for rescued children in Ghana, Cambodia, Thailand, and Honduras. So, so many things that I could talk with Kim about, but what I wanted to do is have her on the show to talk about tiny living. She has lived in a tiny house for several years, some of those as a mom of young children, and I am always really fascinated by minimalists, because this girl, this seven on the Enneagram, guys, I am not a minimalist, and so when I hear about people for years, not just a season, you guys know I lived in an Airstream for six months, but I was not ready to go live in an Airstream for years. But Kim is super committed to to tiny living and leaving a small footprint on the earth. And we talked about tiny living. We also talked about her own life. Um, And she shared about losing her mom as a young girl, the end of her first marriage. But you're going to hear that Kim truly is an encourager. And, you know, when someone who's been through a lot of suffering is an encourager, that encouragement comes from such a depth, such a deep place. And right now I am drawing energy from people who have been through suffering and really walk in resilience. So you are really going to enjoy this conversation with Kim Lewis. Oh my gosh, Kim. I remember the first time. Do you remember when we met? It was on a panel. We were speaking on a panel together. Yes, for Austin Woman Magazine. And I was like, I need to spend more time with her. I love her. That is how I felt. I (laughs) fell in love with you. I think within the first five minutes, we were messing with our microphones and you were wearing this beautiful tailored dress. And I basically unzipped your dress and hooked the microphone on your bra. (laughs) That's like, hey, nice to meet you. Let's do this. That's how friendship starts, man. All in. Just trust, you know? So good. I love that, it. That's how it went. That's how that's it went. And so fun. You are, I mean, you can hear it through your voice. I mean, you are just full of so much joy and energy and love and sunshine. And I'm sure people tell you that all of the time. But it's uh bottled up in about what, four foot eight? Oh girl, give me some credit. Four foot ten. <laughs> Don't be take, don't be taking two inches away from me. I fight for those extra inches. I'm four ten and a half, but honestly, I probably am four nine. But I say four ten, and yes, it's funny. My nickname with a few of my friends is Polly Pocket. It's funny that you say like bottled up because they say sometimes. So if I'm having a bad day, I just feel like I need to have you like my little Polly Pocket in my back in the, my back pocket to give me a smile. I'm like that's really sweet. I'll take it. I'll be your Polly Pocket. I love that. I have started doing work with a new therapist, and a lot of the work that he is teaching me is to imagine, using my imagination in embodying like God's presence with me and care. And on our last session together, he was like, if you need to imagine me walking in and caring for you. And so I bet your girlfriends, uh, I bet in moments when they need a cheer, you are in their imaginations. That's I bet so they sweet. channel you. Oh, that's really sweet. I hope I hope so. I mean, that is why I named our first daughter Sunny because I want to just, you know, we have a short time on this earth and I want it to be something positive and cheerful and yes. In fact, okay. yesterday, this is completely random. Yesterday, the color of the year came out from Pantone and it yes! is the most, did yes! you see it? Yes, I, I did. Oh my gosh. Are you not so excited? I wanted so to excited. hug the Pantone crew. Yes. Yes. So yes. Yes. And it's the color of noonday and our noonday logo. And I'm like, yes. 
Yes, it is. I mean, it's the best color. They just did it the is. right thing. It's exact color. There's so much psychology in color, and that's exactly the color that we need right now is cheerfulness. Yellow. We do. Yellow is optimism, and we are longing for optimism right now. Speaking of that, before I want to, you know, I want everyone to get to know you and your background, but I, how is business going? You are a designer. You have Kim Willis Designs. How has that been, Kim Lewis Designs? Um, how has that been during COVID? You know, honestly, Jessica, God has blessed us in so many ways. And, it, you know, it's been a hard year for everyone. But our business is doing okay, and I'm super grateful. And I have a small team, and we've we've held to, held it together. The, predominantly, we usually design restaurants. Um, obviously, that changed over the course of the year, and less restaurants are opening, sadly. But we have had a few. We've been concepting. We've been doing a lot of other types of projects, and so we're we're really we're really blessed. I mean, I look back on this year and say. I feel like we're in a position where I can just glorify God and say thank you for providing. I mean, he in every way he's provided and so we're we're doing well actually. And um I say that out of total humility because I know yeah. it's been a hard year for everyone. Um yeah. but we've given where we can because it's just like and bought from small businesses and it's just more important than ever. And that's that's been at the core of my company for a while, as it is like you are. We're very, mm-hmm. soul, very much soul sisters in that way. But um, with COVID, it's just – I think it's brought it so much more to the surface for everyone. Mm, so. so true. So good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Okay. So let's – I wanted to start with Extreme Makeover Home Edition because that is – you were eight years the lead designer on this epic, insane. I cannot imagine what it must have been like to work on that show. So, I first of all, for those that are listening that don't remember, give it what was the 101 premise for that Extreme Makeover Home Edition? It was the television show on ABC, and we built built a home for families in five days. Um, and gifted them. Uh, So the premise of it, if you remember, it was Ty Pennington, move that bus. It was always, uh, we were always building a home for a family that was in need in some way or had served their community. And so, yes, we, I worked on that show for a very long time. Lots of stories. This podcast could go for hours if we started going (laughs) into into the stories. But yes, I was the lead designer for, um, gosh, six years. Okay. So what what stories when you look back now? I mean, it's been a few years since you've been on the show, and what comes to your mind immediately is one of those stories that you've held on to all the all these many years later. Well, so we traveled. I was in the I was in the airplane three or four times a week. I mean, I used to compare myself to you. Remember the movie Up in the Air, George Clooney? Like yes. I was traveling. I mean, for six years, just on the road. And what I want to say, I guess, what I learned, and there's there's so many individual stories, but. Um, I saw a country that was very generous, and mm. that always that didn't always translate in forty two minutes of a television show. But we would throw ourselves into a community. Volunteers would show up. Builders would donate. Materials were being donated. You saw the family at the core of the projects we worked on. I saw design changing lives, and I saw people come together like the old barn raising, neighbors helping neighbors. Didn't matter where you were from, what your economic status was, what your the color of your skin was. Everyone was working together, and I, I just always thought, you know, I wish we could see more of this on the news, because mm. this is the core of our country. And now more than ever, I wish I could have bottled up that and recorded it more or something. I mean, the behind the scenes was so powerful, right. Jessica. You know, the, besides the TV storytelling of the producers did, the real behind the scenes of everyday mm. people showing up and helping and donating where they could, mom and pop shops doing everything they could. And in some ways, you know, the, they say we built the houses in seven days, but we actually built them in five days. We had a 106-hour build schedule, if you can imagine this. Oh, my and gosh. It was How nuts. did you do that? How did you do that for six years? Uh, girl, any wrinkle I have on my face, it is not from my children. It is from that television show. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, I mean, we would, my team and I would pull 48 hour days at least, well, usually once a week. I'm not even exaggerating. I can't I mean, tell my, you. My like, jaw is dropped to my floor right now. Well, and part of me thinks that the producer that hired me, it's kind of funny. I'll tell you a secret. 
Um, when they hired me to start on the show, I had never designed a room before. That is crazy. <laughs> never. So, you know, to some degree, if, you know, speaking to people who are listening that might want to try something new and, you know, start a company or start a dream that, that they want to pursue, just do it. I mean, there, I, now I understand, I used to hate the phrase fake it till you make it because I don't like fakeness. I like authenticity, but, um, there is some power in just, you know, believing that you can do what you believe you can do and doing it, you know, and I had never designed a room and I got thrown into Los Angeles. My first episode was in Alaska. They told me I needed to, uh, my very first episode, they told me I needed to come collect rocks from a glacier and make that into the kitchen backsplash. And I was like, what? I mean, um, also, also build a, build a real, um, a standard size football field in the backyard. What? Oh my gosh. And, and get it donated. Everything, get it donated. You know, and so with the years of, you know, with, with that show, it's like just when you thought you couldn't pull something off or that the team couldn't pull something off, it, it happened. And my nickname became Kim Possible because I wouldn't take no for an I, answer. So good. <laughs> it's like that's if I'm so a good. cartoon character, I'm going to be Kim Possible. Um, but, it, but what I saw was just the generosity of our nation and real love and real like hearts wanting to help. And I wish we saw more uh, of that. I do too. We need to bring back that show. Joe and I would cry every time because wasn't it the move that bus? Isn't that the show? Yes. 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 The family would like the bus would move. The family would see their new home. They'd fall to the ground in tears. And, (sighs) and honestly, that level of excitement and passion and servitude in the design field is what I, I, when I left the show, it's like, that's what I wanted to keep doing. Obviously, um, anyway, I just saw how design can change lives and truly help people. And yeah, that was the show. It was nuts. I, you know, I ran a team of like 25 to 30 uh, designers and carpenters and we worked like a family, like a circus. And when I look back at it, it's almost as if I'm talking about someone else's life, you know, wow. my family was always like, where, you know, the where's Waldo? Yes. The, the joke in my family was where's Kimbo? Totally. Because I, you know, we were just working so hard, but it was just such a, just such a blessing to be a part of, to be able to see creativity, empowering people. I feel like the volunteers that showed up got just as much up out of it. And Absolutely. people would be there for different reasons. I remember talking to um, a family, you know, they thought, you know, at first people would be like, oh, they're from Hollywood, you know, and there's this. There's this stigma that comes with that. And I, the first thing I'd say is, oh, no, no, no. I'm not from Hollywood. I'm from Texas, y'all. And, you know, so I was like, just get rid of that thought. We're not here to be like producer types. But um, I did have one crazy story where a carpenter, we were talking about the Lord. And he was just like, man, I can't believe someone from Hollywood would be like believes in God. And um, like, well, that's, I'm from Texas. Um, he said, I want you to meet my wife. And I said, oh, yeah, bring her tomorrow. So the next day he shows up, Kim, my wife's here. We come outside and meet her. And you have to picture this construction site where all the, it's like beep, beep, beep. All the, you know, machines are moving and it's total chaos. Well, I walk up to meet his wife and his wife is blind. And she reaches out and we start talking and she said, "Um, may I pray for you? And uh, I said, yeah, I would love that. You know, and here we are in the midst of all this construction chaos. And she said, I want to pray for you because I see you surrounded by wolves. And I was like, wow. when a blind person says that they see something about you, you listen. And she prayed for protection over me. And I, I looking back, I just think that she saw, I, I see the wolves as the, the industry of television Mm. And the producers that I was around, I, I I know for a fact a lot of them were like, if you think this is some type of mission trip, you're in the wrong field, you know. Mm. But I was, but I did see it as my mission trip, you know, mm. my mission in life, and was to use design to help people. And I was in what an incredible platform to do that. And mm. so this woman just felt that, and she prayed over wow. me. And Jessica, this was my third episode in, so it's like from day one, it was in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'll never forget it. From day one, the Lord was just protecting me and reminding me that you know this might not be easy, but mm-hmm. um, but I'm going to be there with you, going before you. Wow, I want to talk for a second about leadership because I'm thinking 
You are leading a team of 25 people under an enormous amount of, of stress and pressure and very little sleep. And as good as a mission as it is, like people are, be people, people be people. <laughs> yeah. If you imagine yourself maybe in your first year of leading and getting it done and harnessing your power of influence, and then if you were to think about maybe your last year on the show, what was your leadership journey like and how did, yeah, how did you lead and get, drive results through the people that you were, that were on your team? Mm -hmm. Such a good question. I learned over the years to really just honesty was key and nipping things in the bud. And just really like making sure that we were always very open with each other. I mean, we were operating as a family, but I was their, you know, superior, if you want to call that. I don't even like that word. I don't like any word that describes boss. I, I, was, the, I was the leader, but we were operating in a platform that felt like family. Um, and so just always being open and being available and being honest and not letting anything, um, not ever sh- like shoveling anything under a rug. Um, Mm. became a really important, it was like, we don't have time for, um, this to fester it. We need to talk now. We need to figure it out now. It was a real community, um, uh, kind of vibe and feeling. And we all, you know, there were definitely emotions. I mean, we were using copy reams of copy paper to take a nap. I mean, that's, there's human nature there that with tired feelings and all that, but, I mean, we really just loved each other. And at the end of the day, we were working toward the same goal. And if you could always keep that goal in your mind, you found the energy and um, dedication to pull through the hard times. And if anything, it was usually our team banding together and, you know, kind of putting our foot down where we needed to with producers asking us to do more than we were already doing. Mm -hmm. Because it's producers who call the shots on all these shows, right? They just push you. They push you to the point. I mean, I was t- constantly pushing back. Of My team is already – I've got – I would have people end up in the hospital um, almost wow. on a monthly basis from exhaustion, from all sorts of things. I mean, I remember getting a phone call that one of my team members had gotten shot in the eye with a nail gun. And That's it had nice. come from the second – exactly. It had come from the second floor, so she was fine. But we went through, I mean, literal blood, sweat, and tears together. And so I would say we just banded, and we're still like family to this day. You um, are? You've kept in touch? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's a very tight group. And um, we still we still talk. And um, yeah, so really it was more like managing family. But I actually do love managing different personalities. And they're all creative. So there are a lot of personalities in the group, you know? Totally. So why did you end up leaving the show? My work-life balance was so off. I um, had been married. My first marriage actually got married. Literally, the I got the phone call for to join Extreme Makeover. I'm not even kidding. Five minutes before I walked down the aisle. Oh my! So gosh. the joke in our family was that he married me and the show that day. Um, and so I, I just was way off balance. Um, a long story of just hurt and pain and uh, betrayal and. My first husband cheated, and but I was a I was away a lot, you know. So, and I can't say that that behavior was because me because I was gone, but it was evident and clear that I needed to get um, some better work life balance. And my body was just tired, you know. I mean, can you can imagine the amount of hours that um, lack of sleep and all of that? So, it was a hard decision. It was like leaving my family. I gave him a huge notice and. Um, Just recognized that it was time for me to start um, building a dream outside of that. And um, my first client was actually Jewel, the singer-songwriter, because she saw my work on the show. And I had never designed outside of the show. And she was like, I want to hire you for my house in Texas. So I was like, I guess I need to put a company name together. So Kim Lewis Designs, I guess, will do, you know. And um, flew off to her house. And I continued to consult with other different TV shows because I I thrived off of the production and the fast paced and the uh-huh. level you know I thrived off of it I was almost addicted to it probably yeah and oh, the, you know the adrenaline and just the rush from having to be so creative under such a tight deadline I mean I would lo- I would just love it <laughs> yeah 
You know what's so cool though, Jessica, is I see that because so every season you would real you would say, "Am I going to go back or am I am I not?" What are the pros and cons? Every season I went back and I went back and I went back and finally 2012 came and I knew that this was a season and the show was honestly kind of on its way out. Um, so I, I I said this is going to be my last episode. Well, that episode was uh, we went and built ten houses in ten days. Oh um, as if one wasn't enough um, for Joplin, Missouri, after the tornado had hit. Wow. And it was at that episode that I met the um, some of my favorite nonprofits that I still to this day work with. Um, in the middle of all this chaos, uh, Meg with Art Feeds, it's a nonprofit that works to empower children through art therapy um, and art programming. She said, we're going to build an art center in Ghana, West Africa. Do you want to come? And I was like, oh, yes, and sign me up. I've always felt like I would work in Africa at some point. And so it's interesting just looking back. And well, from there, we've built five art centers. And these art centers work to um, empower children through creativity that have been mm. or, or that have survived trafficking. Mm. And so it's just cool how you look back and go, well, I, I really believe I was supposed to be on that show until that episode, because that wow. episode is what really catapulted me into working with these nonprofits and getting to do what I genuinely feel like I was put on earth to do, which is the art centers. I mean, it's a, it's our biggest passion here. Mm. Um, and we try to do one a year and, um, but it's just so, it's so cool to look back and go, wow, I really think that's why the, the timeline happened in that way. My dream. I want to go with you on one of your trips to Ghana. Oh, you need to come. Oh, my Putting gosh. Putting that out there. Putting that yes. out there. It's – oh, my gosh. We had some friends over for dinner the other night from Rwanda, the founders of African New Life, a nonprofit we support. And just having Africans in our home, I just – I mean, I went to eight countries in 2020. And so – or 2019, yeah. what am I saying? 2020 yeah, yeah. was a big <laughs> – Fat zero. Yeah, exactly. Big fat zero. 2019. I mean, that was my life for 10 yes. years. So this is just so – it's, it, you know, we're, we're forgetful humans. And as much as, I mean, my my whole life work is, is also, yeah, creating opportunity for the vulnerable around the globe. But man, I I miss the connection, the actual in person connection. I I'm like I'm going, I'm, sure I'm going soon. I got to, I got to. Yes, I mean, at what point? You know, I totally hear you, and I I know that feeling. And my my daughter's godmother is a woman in Ghana. We call her Ma Paulina, and I just she's just one of the. I feel just so safe in her arms. Like it sounds silly, mm. but she's like a mother to me. Mm. Um, and yeah, the African spirit is so real. I feel like their eyes are just straight, the window straight to their soul. They're just, and their smiles. And I miss it too, Jessica. We need to hop on a plane. I we mean, do. It's we do. I mean, it's not time, but it's- It's not time, but it will be. It will <laughs> yeah. be soon. It will um, be soon. Holding out hope. So did you know that you wanted to- definitely focus on interior design? Because I'm sure during those six years, you were exposed to so many different design possibilities, but you knew, I want to start my own business. I want to continue on this path. Uh, yeah. I And I did a lot of architecture on the on the show. I um, didn't study architecture, but I was in it. Every, you know, that's, I actually drew the homes. I drew the architecture for the homes. And so architecture and interior design and really like the project management process of that became, it, I love it. I absolutely love it. And so, yeah, I think it just felt natural. I've always been an entrepreneur. It felt natural to say, this is what I should do. I'm going to start my own company and, and do it. But it's, it's, you know, as you know, owning a business is so hard. And I feel like every year I, I fail at some part of it and I learn from that. And I've gotten comfortable with failing. I I am a three on the Enneagram, so it's like I, I push myself to absolute extremes. Um, but I know that I've learned that failing is okay and actually mm. really healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, but two years ago, you wouldn't have heard Kim Lewis say that. I mean, this is kind of new new for me. It's like I failed. It's okay. I learned from it. Let's grow. Um, Mm. and so, yeah, I, but yeah, designing and it's, it really is my passion. And when I got out of extreme, I, I was like, I had designed 120 plus homes. And so I did have a a moment where I was like, I think I'm good to not do a home for a while. So that's when I started uh, dipping into restaurants and I love creating environments where people feel really, um, engaged and their senses are all, um, 
Mm -hmm. on, you know, like engaging your senses. When you walk into a restaurant, it's all about the smells and the sounds and the look and the feel and where you sit and all of those things. Kind of like Morocco. You've been to Morocco, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It has this amazing just vibe about it. And so anyway, that's kind of like I love getting to create a place where people can feel something, whatever that's meant to be. I wanted to ask about this failure bit because – I'm thinking there are a lot of opportunities for failure when you are in design. I was interior designer for a hot second, and I – I didn't know that. I, oh, it was, it was a hot second. We used to flip homes. My husband and I flipped homes um, for several years in Austin. We did maybe 12 houses, and then that transitioned into other people seeing the homes we flipped and then other people asking me for help. But I remember – My first, oh my gosh. Actually, funny story. My current business partner, Travis, I mean, we've now partnered together for 10 years, but I was there. They moved to town. And so they were, I think, maybe one of my first clients. And so they knew I was scrappy, didn't totally know what I was doing. (laughs) But, you know, you set up these different wholesale accounts and then you get money not only off of, you know, your hourly design fee, but then if they order through you and then you upcharge on whatever they're ordering or anyway, all of this was new to me. But basically, they ordered a couch through me and I get a text from Travis's wife, Suzanne, and it's a picture of the couch in their home because it's white glove delivery. And it was like, this is not the right color. Oh, no. And lo and behold, I had like, this is why I was never meant to be an interior design. I am not a person (laughs) of details. And it is such a detailed job. And so I'm looking at this couch, and we were so broke at the time. This is right when we were about to start New Day because we we had decided to job. We're super broke. And I was just ashamed. I was so ashamed. And I was like, what am I going to do? I mean, I have to eat this. And we didn't have the money to eat. So I – to eat the couch. We did have enough money yeah. to eat. But anyway, basically <laughs> my mom, my mom rescued me. She bought the couch to this day. That sofa is their sofa. It's a gorgeous sofa that might Travis and then but but you know what? It didn't stop Travis from saying, I'm gonna take a bet on this girl and we're gonna become business partners. So talk about learning from a failure. But I just remember, Love. you know, you see a wrong couch in someone's home and that is on you. And I just felt just it took me probably weeks to kind of walk through that. So, yeah, tell me a little bit about some of your fails and how how you've learned to let it go and and digest and metabolize it a lot quick more quickly. Yeah, no, that story is hilarious and definitely I can relate. Um, I just learned that you know uh, it's it's okay and as long as you own it, own up to it. There's a lot of ego in design and architecture. And I saw that I did see that when I was on the show. And I so I just try to operate without that. And you know what, we are humans. Um, The details are real in design. And so taking our time, it's a lot. And honestly, it can kind of um, pull it can pull you down, you know, the it's like mud kind of going through some mud to get through details. But we also sometimes really nerd out on the details. Um, So I've just found that, you know, it's okay. You just own up to it um, and and just always have the integrity to go back to your client and do what's right. Um, Mm -hmm. And then it'll, you know, it'll figure itself out. Most people are very, very understanding. And Mm -hmm. but I I would say we try not to let that happen. But that's part of the challenge with scaling a company and a business and design is just that that skill set and knowledge. Um, I think the hardest thing to learn in design is scale. And knowing, mm. okay, you're ordering this light or this sofa or whatever, and how is that going to fit in the home? I mean, Ugh. especially with tiny homes. Um, the tiny home, my biggest, I would, you know, I want to say it's fail, but it's probably just a, I guess that's a, it feels like a strong word, but I mean, it is what it is. We started a tiny home business and I never sold a tiny home. <laughs> so, mm. I, you know, it didn't work. Um, it turns out people love tiny homes, but they don't want to buy them. So <laughs> um, I I don't think that – yeah, it's safe to say that was a – Kim Lewis Tiny Homes was a failed business. But I don't like using that word because I don't want to hurt my because, business yeah, partner at the time's feeling. But, like, right. it's, it's the truth. 
if well, it and, yeah, but by the but then also you of course you learn from your failures, so it's all about reframing. And but that is why I wanted you to have you on the show, because because this whole series is about going against the grain. And when I think about tiny living, I'm like, for me, I I well, actually, I did. I guess I lived in an airstream for six months, and let you me tell did. you. I would never do that again. And I didn't even really live there. I slept there. So tell me, how did you go down this tiny home living path? Yes, such a strange story. So, well, remember when I said I went off and consulted for some other television shows? I was hired by, at the time it was on FYI. FYI is Tiny House Nation. And you have to remember on Extreme, I was drawing houses that were Easily 2,500, 3,000, sometimes 5,500 square foot because we were ha- you know, helping a family of, with 15 children. So you had to right. put them somewhere. So it, I went from drawing those types of homes to now working with a show that wanted me to draw a house that was 110 square feet. And I would be like, oh I'm sorry, you want me to put how many things? What do you want to go into that? I'm, not, I'm sorry. It was so hard. I remember trying to cram like, a staircase, a pantry, I mean, a dish or a washer dryer. And it, it was like, this is very hard. But as I got to know, uh, unlike Extreme Makeover, on Extreme Makeover, no, I never talked to the families directly until we moved the bus. And then they saw, they got, I got to meet them. I was like behind the scenes completely. I was looking, studying about them and all that. On Tiny House Nation, um, I got to work with the families from day one. And so, mm. you know, it was like, why do you want to do this? What do you do? What? So I found myself gravitating toward these people. And for the first time in my life, after having drawn so many homes in a very short amount of time, I found myself drawing something that I could picture myself living in. And it was because probably- Because you are tiny. You are well, tiny. <laughs> Everyone always says that. Do you do tiny homes because you're really tiny? Like, no, that's not. No. But anyway, Uh -uh. um, yeah, I would be on construction sites and the security guards would pull me over like, "Um, sorry, if you're under 18, you're not allowed to be here. And I would (laughs) stomp my boot and say, "Um, I'm running the show. (laughs) Um, Like, you you just messed with the wrong girl. Um, But anyway, so. So you're designing these tiny houses for Tiny House Nation. Yes. And I'm just kind of enthralled with them. Um, more, more so, I was really, I had, at this point, I was 32 years old, uh, recently divorced or had been going through separation, divorce and all of that. So I was really on my own again. And I found myself like really relating to the people that wanted tiny homes. They love to travel. I had never bought a home because I was always on the road. I love traveling. It's at the core of who I am. I was afraid that owning or having a mortgage would hold me, hold my feet too, you know, too close to the ground in one spot for too long. And so I had never bought a house, but on with this, I could see, I could see it. I could understand that why they wanted it. And so, um, yeah, I ended up partnering, uh, with someone and I actually, I, to backtrack, I designed one in Austin for, for friends and we collaborated a lot and it got a lot of press and I started getting a lot of phone calls um, about that house. And so as, you know, as so you designed would, it for someone else. Yes. We designed it for someone else and, um, it was, it aired on the show and it got a lot of press on tiny house nation. And, uh, I, I started getting a lot of phone calls for that, sh- for that house and, you know, supply demand, you think, Oh, there's a lot of people that want this. So I'm going to start looking at how I could build a business around, uh, tiny homes. And so, That's really kind of where it started. And uh, yeah, from there, it just, I I love you. But you chose to live in a tiny house. (laughs) Yeah. So fast forward, and um, I'm engaged to my current husband, love of my life, Joey. And he, you know, we're we're talking and I'm engaged. And we're, I was like, hey, would you ever, he's real adventurous. He loves being outside. I started talking about, would you ever, could you see us living in a tiny house? And he actually loved the idea because it got us out outside on some acreage, um, want to be indoor, outdoor, could understand that we could pay this thing off in about three years. Um, he was like, yeah, let's do it. So we ended up building a tiny house as our model show show house for Kim Lewis Tidy Homes. We built it uh, with a builder out in Arizona. 
drove it. It went and showed at Dwell. Dwell on Design has a year, an annual um, design show. Thousands of people in Los Angeles walked through my house. And we, we thought, well, we'll just buy this one. Like, this will be our house. We found some land to rent out in Driftwood, Texas, um, and drove it back from Los Angeles to Arizona for a couple little punch list items. We, we, we parked it there till the land was ready, and then we brought it all the way back to Austin. So, so you bring it back to Austin, mm-hmm. and does a tiny house, do you hook it up to plumbing, and how tiny are we talking about? Mine, ours is 575 square feet. So you'll hear people in New York say, that is not tiny. My apartment is half that size. Um, but for that Sounds a home, tiny to me. It's tiny. Yeah, it's small. So it's 575 square feet. It's um, an L shape. It's got a living unit and a bedroom unit. And we uh, – these are oversized. So um, there's a lot of logistics, but we won't go into that. But the ones you see that are hooked behind a, a truck – Those are only eight foot wide and ours is 11 foot wide. So someone with a commercial driver's license has to drive it. So you, you have an 18 wheeler, pick it up. It's not easy. I mean, you have to get all the utilities set up. We, we had to run plumbing, you know, water, sewage, um, electrical, all of these utilities to get the house ready to live in. All of that was very hard, but we did, I, we lived off of rainwater. That's probably my favorite, one of my favorite things about the tiny house when it was in Driftwood. And I'll tell you where it is now in a second, but we connected it to rainwater and Joey and I for two years lived off of the rainwater of Austin, Texas, minus two small deliveries of rain during a drought season. How crazy wow. is that? That yes. is so crazy. That is really crazy. So you're you're this designer. So it seems like it was this idea of I'm just wondering what is calling you. What what did you learn about yourself? Because I'm assuming that you this was the smallest amount of space you've lived in, and that you'd never lived off rainwater before. So tell me some things that you've learned, and then what are some of those things that you've kept? Because now you got two babies. And yeah. I know you're built. You're building a house, right? So you're. Are you, I'm assuming you're moving, and you're not going to be living in your tiny house anymore. And I'm just curious how that tiny living now impacted how you're designing your house and having two kids and all of that. Yeah. So, well, we lived in the tiny house, and we had our first uh, daughter, Sunny. And the first year of her life, um, we we. I honestly, Jessica, I loved it. I loved the fact that we didn't have a dining table. Um, Sunny and I would sit on the floor, use the coffee table, or, um, I I felt so close to her and I, I, I've, you know, we've traveled to third world countries. I see that children don't need all these things. They don't need the toys on toys on toys on toys. They're super happy playing with leaves and small things. And so I felt very comfortable with baby number one in there. Joey was starting to itch. He's like, this is crowded. The baby's in our room, which most are for the first year of life anyway. Um, so he started thinking, we need to go, we need to start thinking, you know, this is the end of our tiny home days. But, but I, I honestly loved, I, I loved the fact that we, what was, what's in our tiny home is very special to us. Everything in the house has a story. Everything in the house we use, it makes you pare down to the things you actually really need. All of those things are still at the forefront of my mind when I am thinking, you know, about this new house and what we're, so backtrack, baby number two, we get pregnant with baby number two. The babies are 14 and a half months apart. So you can imagine at this point in the tiny house, we are stressing (laughs) because (laughs) it's one thing to have, um, you know, it's one thing to have one baby in the tiny house, but two, plus we have an 85 pound lab. So it's like, man, it's a good thing to be small. Exactly. Um, and our family at this point probably thinks we're all crazy. We had Thanksgiving dinners. We had a Sunny's birthday party with 50 people at the tiny home. The doors open, so it's just all about indoor outdoor living. Honestly, I love that we don't just sink into the sofa and watch a ton of TV in there because you're so connected with nature. I mean, there's a lot of pluses. Um, it's funny how you know how quickly you have children, they're older now, but it's funny how quickly children can like create a chaos and like a like a yes. tornado. They come through and they mess up everything. And it's just insane. Well, at least in the tiny house, it feels very um, manageable because it's very quick to pick up because everything is within 
10 feet of your arm. <laughs> so <laughs> like, Here you go. And so I, anyway, we get pregnant with Bear. Our, we have a son and he just turned one. And uh, so we did actually buy a house last year, October. And it's, uh, we're not building, we're renovating it. We're, um, so right now we, we moved to the tiny home, just so you know, we, the tiny home is an investment at this point. I mean, it's a home, it's been a home office for me during COVID. Mm-hmm. Joey's parents live out of town or out of the state. So when they come, they can stay there. We can put it up on Airbnb. We haven't done that yet, but that's going to help pay for daycare. Um, and so it's been a huge blessing. We've moved it with us and we moved it the month before Bear was born. Can you imagine those stress? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and let me just tell you that on the way, this is just for pure comedy here. Um, our tiny house, when they were pulling it into the driveway, fell. Oh, my gosh. And it went into a ditch. And I was eight months pregnant. And everyone oh, who was there thought gosh. I was um, going to have a baby. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. So we have a lot of stories with this tiny home. And anyway, so now it's on our new property. We have three acres. We have a house with, you know, a bedroom for each baby. And it does – I go – it's funny. When we moved into the new house, we – still migrated through this place like the unit that we were in this small in the small house. So mm-hmm. there is a closeness that our family has gained already from being in the tiny house. Now timeline wise, we are living back in the tiny house right now, Jessica, because we're renovating the the main house. And so okay. all four of us and the 85 pound lab are in one bedroom. Um, I'm oh notorious for letting the dog sleep with us, even though we, you know, we already have enough people and things in the room with us, <laughs> but so we're all back in there and we're, we have our Christmas tree up and it's amazing. I honestly love wow. it. And I'll tell you something, girl, jo- Joey, who has been like, not into it anymore. He's like, I need more space. I need more space. He, the last couple of weeks has absolutely loved it. And he, wow. he actually looks at me. He's like, I kind of do. I see why, I see now why you love it in here. And do I think you, it's be, Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just think it's because of how close we all are. And, mm-hmm. and it just feels really sweet. And this year has all been about togetherness with our small groups of family and people, right? And mm-hmm. it, I, I think it just feels really comfortable and cozy. And, and it, it's nice to have less frills and less space to clean and – we're just really close. Mm. Well, I was going to ask you how it has impacted how you approach design now because I would imagine, I mean, I guess with restaurants or when you're working with clients, do you actually encourage people when maybe they have this idea of how much square footage they need or what they actually need? Has there been situations where you've influenced them towards living a little bit smaller? I would say restaurants kind of, you have to have your standards with um, distance and all of that. So it's a little tough, but yes, with homes for sure. Um, I I think it also, for me, I, I see design as a option or opportunity to be a storyteller. And so the way I've encouraged my clients after having lived in a tiny home to make their home special, really no matter how big it is, but is to is to make sure that the things in your home tell the story of who you are. When when I if I bring you over to the tiny house like right now, I would be able to say, Jessica, I got this in Africa and I got this in, you know, Napa Valley and I got this. It's like our whole home no matter the size tells our story. And and it also encourages you to think like how what do you really need? Let's live more sustainably. We don't need all these plastics. We don't need all as many toys as we think we need for our children. Like paring things down, especially in this day and age, is really healthy, not only for the environment, but for your soul. And it's also healthy to teach that to our next generation. So now because I've lived in this in this type of space, I do love encouraging my clients. And a lot of times we're being handed the opportunity to like you did with that sofa. We're buying materials and things for our clients on behalf of our clients with their money. And if we're going to be spending their money, we want to spend it really wisely. So Hmm. not only are we thinking about sustainability, but we're thinking about artisans and mom and pop shops and how can we 
spend that $50 they want to spend on a pillow, but not go to a big box store, but go to a place where we know we're actually making an impact. To keep up with Kim, you can go find her on Instagram at Kim Lewis Designs. And then she also has a YouTube channel, which is really fun at Kim Lewis. And guys, before I go, I just got to say, y'all are sharing this podcast because we have had more downloads and listens in the last couple of weeks since our launch than we ever have in the last three years. And thank you because that's all you. That is all you. And I just love it. I really do love this community. I love getting to be in your earbuds and I I love getting to have these conversations. Guys, I want your feedback. So I'm mainly on Instagram DMs. Would you slide into my DMs and just share with me maybe who you might want to hear from on this series? Because we are still in the process of booking guests and the series is all about going upstream against the grain and just living outside of culture's comfort zone. So slide in my DMs, Jessica Honiger over on Instagram. Our wonderful music for today's show is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kohlholz. And I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.